Sono molto felice di essere qui in ricordo di Stephen Jay Gould all'Istituto Veneto di Scienze, Lettere e Arti. Molto grazie per l'invito. And, and that's about it. So. Now, we don't usually think about the logic of our scientific methods leading to closed-mindedness and the inability to see alternatives or evaluate evidence, but that's exactly what sometimes happens in evolutionary biology with one of its most popular methods. Um, despite its benign reputation and true to the warnings given by S S Steve Gould and Dick Lewinton, 33 years ago, in a profoundly influential paper, The Spandrels of San Marco and the Panglossian Paradigm. The issues about method revolve around evolutionary adaptations, one of evolution's biggest successes. Evolution, evolutionary adaptations, as you know, are traits that exist today because, because they were products of natural selection acting in the past evidence uh, history of the species. And here we have the timber wolf, one of Darwin's examples. Descended from more generalized and slower carnivores, the wolf evolved specialized traits for hunting swift prey like deer and elk. And we start with variation in the traits of speed and strength. And because there was a reproductive advantage associated with these traits, we have the wolf specialized adaptations for speed and strength. Um, today. Uh, we start with the mean speed of uh, 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 the wolf traits and, and we have a population distribution. Some are slower, some are faster. We have a broad distribution. It's highly variable in the ancestral population, but over uh, evolutionary time uh, we have uh, selection pushing that population average up to the concentration of higher speed in the wolves. So most of the population is up here and uh, selection increases speed over evolutionary time. And we get a peak uh, in the population distribution of speed. So there you have one way that selection produces adaptation. Um, now let's consider a breed of scientists uh, called a methodological or heuristic adaptationist. Um, this is an evolutionary biologist who assumes at the beginning of investigation that the trait that they're looking at is indeed an adaptation. As one of the founders of modern evolutionary theory, Ernst Meyer, memorably wrote in reaction to the Spandrels paper and in defense of an adaptationist research program, the adaptationist question, what is the function of a given structure or organ, has been for centuries the basis for every advance in physiology. So while this approach may look biased, since it seems that adaptive explanations are going to be unfairly favored, right? This favor is supposed to be only temporary. Um, and this more benign methodological adaptationist method has been advocated by many biologists since Meyer. And here is a philosopher's characterization of it. When the hypothesis of optimality or adaptation is investigated first, deviation from the optimum provides evidence that other factors are at work, and perhaps the nature of the deviation will give clues about where to look next. This is usually described as the most helpful way to proceed. Look for a selective explanation in every case, and it might lead you to non-selective explanations, which you could then pursue if that's where the evidence led. It is still an open question, though, whether the method in practice allows non-adaptive explanations ever to win the day. Do researchers who avow such approaches in fact find themselves willing to embrace non-adaptive explanations when the evidence points toward them? Problems only arise for the methodological adaptationists when a trait appears in the population that is not a direct consequence of natural selection. In Gould and Lewinton's 1979 paper, they discussed the spandrels of the Duomo of San Marco. And of course, uh, they said, which are the triangular areas between the arches holding up the dome and into which the saints have been painted in. And they write, 
um, that the design is so elaborate and, and, and Dick uh, Lewinton did such a beautiful job describing these earlier this morning. Uh, he said it was harmonious, they said it was harmonious, purposeful. We are tempted to view it as the starting point of any analysis, but this would invert the proper path. Yet, evolutionary biologists in their tendency to focus exclusively on immediate adaptation to local conditions do tend to ignore architectural constraints and perform just such an inversion of explanation. So in their paper, Gould and Lewinton emphasize a basic fact of evolution, namely that not every biological character is adaptive and that there exist alternative evolutionary explanations available and sometimes appropriate such as evolutionary developmental accounts, architectural byproduct accounts, and accounts that cite correlations of growth, like the one with the chin that Dick mentioned earlier. But they emphasize that there is an important difference between paying lip service to this view and actually using this theoretical assumption in actual research. Now, later in history, 33 years on, we are in a position to see a clear contrast between two distinct methodologies and corresponding sets of questions. And we know that different questions make different answers legitimate. And this is something that philosophers of science like me like to look at. And I call this the logic of research questions. The logic of the research question you ask dictates what type of answers you can give. So you need to think very hard about the research questions you ask because the questions you ask can lead you to actually miss what's really going on and therefore to scientific failure. So the methodological adaptationist asks, following Myers' rebuttal to Gould and Lewinton, what is the function of this trait? And there are any number of possible answers to this question which take the form the function of this trait is A, the function of this trait is B, or you know, so on and so forth. Now, I characterize an alternative approach, approach here as what I call the evolutionary factors approach, and whose research question is what evolutionary factors account for the form and distribution of this trait? And it has a series of possible answers, including this trait occurs in the population because it had function B, which is an adaptation, so there's an adaptive answer. Uh, this trait occurred widely in this population because it is genetically linked to a trait that is highly adaptive in this species, or possibly this trait has its current form largely because of an ancestral developmental pattern, and so on and so forth. There's a you know, wide variety of answers, the, the kinds of things that Steve Gould liked to write his natural history columns about, for example. So I'm now going to introduce a case study in the logic of research questions. It's a distracting and interesting case study, but please don't lose sight of the fact that it's only a case study and not itself the point of the talk. I'm going to use my case study on the evolution of female orgasm, um, which Steve was very interested in, and, and he wrote about it and defended it in his column in Natural History magazine before I ever published on it. In fact, it was one of his favorite examples of an evolutionary developmental byproduct. And I'm going to use it to illustrate and confirm how the methodological adaptationist approach can lead scientists astray. And I, I should start say at the start that reports of the demise of the byproduct account of female orgasm are greatly exaggerated. A recent study by Brendan Zeech and Pekka Santilla claimed to have refuted the byproduct account. They first said that the byproduct account, which I'll talk more about in a moment, predicted that what they called orgasmic function could be should be correlated in male and female twins. But their twin study showed that it was not correlated. Um, the, the rebuttal and analysis I'm about to give um, is being published soon in Animal Behavior um, in their form section. It was accepted for publication on the day, the day before yesterday, the day that I left on this trip. Um, in any case, the chief and fatal problem with uh, the study is that the traits studied under the name orgasmic function 
were hopelessly different. It, it, they counted the time to orgasm in the men, that is, the time it takes uh, for a man to have an orgasm once he starts copulation, and compared it to a totally different measure in women, namely whether or not she has orgasm. Um, as you can see, these two traits, time to orgasm in the men and whether or not she has orgasm in the woman, are quite distinct and they would not be expected to correlate in any case. Uh, and so uh, the uh, uh, lack of correlation of these two traits that Zeech and Fantilla found was to be expected. And it doesn't say anything about the byproduct view, uh, contrary to their claim. And again, this rebuttal uh, has been accepted by animal behavior, and it's uh, for publication. It's going to be coming out soon. Um, in my book published in uh, 2005, The Case of the Female Orgasm, and quickly translated into Italian, and thank you very much, to Tomo, um, uh, I gave detailed examinations of all 21 published theories of how female orgasm had evolved. 20 of them claimed that orgasm was an evolutionary adaptation. And um, with the wolf slide, we saw an important kind of evidence that's at stake when evolutionists consider an adaptive account of a trait. Uh, we see that directional selection uh, produces a peak in the distribution of a trait in the population. Now, I'd like you to contrast this slide of the distribution of wolves with this dem di the distribution that we find of orgasmic performance among women. Um, this curve is represented by an x-axis of overall orgasmic performance with heterosexual vaginal intercourse, while the y-axis represents the distribution in the population. Note that about 13% of women always have uh, orgasm from intercourse. Roughly a third of women rarely or never do. About 13% of women never have orgasm at all from any means ever. Um, as you can see, this curve is basically flat. Uh, simple selective forces, whether directional or balancing, produce peaks in the curves of traits. Um, and um, all but one of the proposed selective explanations for female orgasms do predict a peak in this curve, like the wolf curve. But as you can see, uh, there are no peaks. Hence, nearly every one of the selective and adaptive explanations for female, or, female orgasm is undermined by the data for sex, from sexology. Um, there is another way in which the adaptive exp explanations, including the female choice theory, are all undermined by the sex, sexology data as well. Uh, Brendan Zeech and colleagues examined correlations of such potentially adaptive traits and orgasmic activity in a population of nearly 3,000 women, finding zero to weak, very weak correlations in all 19 traits they examined, including libido, social class, orientation towards uncommitted sex, restrictive attitudes towards sex, lifetime numbers of sex partners, and so on. None of the correlations has significant genetic components, thus undercutting any ascription of a fitness benefit to orgasm. In addition, there has never been any evidence linking orgasm to fitness or numbers of babies, frequency of intercourse, or any other trait correlated to fitness. And this new study echoes this very significant lack. In other words, having orgasms is not associated with having more or better babies, the very basis of selective change. Now, I, I'd like you to consider the problem of why male mammals have nipples. I know you have. Nipples clearly provide a reproductive advantage to female mammals by providing the means to feed the offspring. They have an evolutionary function. But there is no known contribution for fitness or function for the males. The evolutionary ex explanation for the existence of male nipples is a non-adaptive one in males based on the development of the embryo. Males and females share the same embryological form at the beginnings of life, 
they start off with the same basic body plan and only if the chromosomally male uh, horn, embryos receive a jolt of hormones in the eighth week of pregnancy do any sexually distinguishing ca characteristics appear and the sexes diverge. In females, nipples are adaptations. In the males, uh, they, the males get them for free. This sort of explanation is called developmental or non-adaptive. Male nipples are seen as the evolutionary byproducts with no function of their own. A parallel explanation was offered by anthropologist Donald Simons back in 1979 for female orgasm. Females have orgasm because orgasm is strongly selected in males. Both sexes share the same common form in the womb. Here you see the early embryo's genetical tubercle, which turns into the penis in the males, oh wait, penis in the males, and the clitoris in the females. These organs with common embryological origins are homologs. The tissues involved in orgasm for males and females are also homologs, including nerve tissues, erectile tissues, and muscle fibers. Thus, females get the functioning orgasmic tissues through this embryological connection and are often capable, not always but often, of having orgasms under the right conditions of rhythmic stimulation. There is a variety of evidence supporting this byproduct account of female orgasm, although it has encountered a great deal of resistance. Part of this is surely the byproduct name, which many women find demeaning. So I'm thinking of renaming it the Fantastico Bonus account, which is much more accurate after all. Simon's account accords well with the data available about human female sexuality. Women don't masturbate by simulating intercourse. They do it by stimulating the clitoris directly or indirectly. Men masturbate the same way, by stimulating the homologous organ. This theory also allows us to make sense of the infrequency with which women experience orgasm with intercourse. Simon's general thesis is also supported by the non-human primate evidence, which shows, among other things, that female stump tail macaques have the distinctive contractions and other bodily markers characteristic of orgasm. Note that Simon's and I are not denying that the clitoris, as an organ of sensation, almost certainly has been selected because it aids the female in sexual excitement and induces and prepares her to seek out and have intercourse. But this reasoning does not extend to the use of these same tissues for female orgasm. Orgasm is the special reflex that sometimes results from clitoral and genital excitement. So now it's time to go back and consider the female choice type of sexual selection hypothesis, which is the only adaptive hypothesis which is compatible with that flat curve distribution. The basic idea is that the female will mate with more than one male over a short period of time and have orgasm preferentially with high quality males. The assumption here is that orgasm is accompanied by a mechanism of uterine upsuck. I didn't make up that name. It makes it more likely that the female will be fertilized by the higher quality male. Thus, the orgasmic women are required to respond to orgasms only sometimes with intercourse. Yes, with high quality males, no, with lower quality males. This type of female sexual selection scenario can theoretically produce the flat curve of orgasmic variation, but only provided that the force of selection is strong. But consider what is needed to fulfill this model. It requires multiple mating by women before insemination. How many women fulfill this in a given population? And how strong a selection pressure can this be? Also given that selection on only one sex is half as strong a selection on both. And you can see here that I filled in the various strengths of evidence for the various assumptions of this model. All of it is extremely unlikely to add up to the strong sexual selection required in order to explain the very high level of phenotypic variation of orgasm. Moreover, in a new study published last year by neurophysiologist Kim Wallen and I, 
those women who reported orgasm with intercourse, and th these are the women in the white bars here. These are two separate samples. And these are the women in the white bars, women who did not have orgasm, sorry, uh, women who reported orgasm with intercourse in the white bars. They had significantly shorter uh, distance between their clitoris and their urinary meatus. It's pronounced cumdi. We, we didn't notice that problem until too late. Um, uh, then did women who did not report orgasm with intercourse. They had much longer distances. Uh, we found this strong correlation in the two distinct data sets and the difference was highly statistically significant over two standard deviations with an R of 0.6. We also found the anatomical distance was uh, strongly predictive of whether a woman had inter orgasm with intercourse. So if you could measure the clitoral urinary manus distance in a woman, you could predict whether she has orgasm with intercourse. You can also see that it's irrelevant to whether she has orgasm with ma masturbation as we would expect. So overlooking for now the substantial hurdles embodied by this evidence, female choice theory can only work if there is a physiological relation um, between female orgasm and fecundity, a mechanism which is usually simply assumed. The hypothesis had achieved widespread acceptance since 1990s through the work of Robin Baker and Mark Bellis, the Upsuck hypothesis. But look at their data. In one data set, they have one out of 11 couples contributing 93 of the 107 data, 27 data points. That's nearly three quarters of the data. Another four couples contributed one data point each and so on. But extrapolating to the population at large based primarily on the results of a single subject badly violates standard statistical practice. And in the end, the Baker and Bellis data are statistically worthless and no scientific conclusions can be drawn from them. But many dozens and even hundreds of adaptationists nevertheless use this paper to support their desired conclusion that female orgasm was an adaptation and used it directly against the viability of the byproduct account despite its obvious flaws. The human f evolution field in instant acceptance of the Baker and Bellis paper and its continuing use of the paper in lectures and teaching as well as research for at least 12 years until my book came out and also beyond was an example of adaptationist bias getting the better of scientific judgment or the application of normal statistical standards. Adaptationist bias consists in favoring adaptive accounts over the non-adaptive accounts without good evidence for doing so or indeed against the evidence. Nowadays, the favorite mechanism for the preferential movement of the sperm of the superior male is the effect of oxytocin. But those experiments use a dose of oxytocin 400 times the actual dose released in natural orgasm. So those results are irrelevant to the biological question without further research. So again, theoretically and empirically, the female choice hypothesis is facing very substantial hurdles before it could be accepted as a plausible theory of female orgasm. The byproduct hypothesis, on the other hand, has much evidence supporting it. So how are the two evaluated and compared by biologists? Here's where the biases and above all methods really play a crucial role. Let's go back when a biological adaptationist does research and asks their key question, in this case, what is the function of female orgasm? The assumption is that selection brought the orgasmic structures to their present state and the problem or challenge is to figure out which selective hypothesis is correct. So the possible answers include, for example, pair bond hypothesis or the high quality male theory, 
But some of the adaptations in this case see the byproduct view as a sort of null hypothesis. In general usage in science or biology, a null hypothesis is usually a negative alternative to a positive correlational hypothesis. So the, the positive hypothesis would be one in which a trait was positively correlated with fitness or some component of fitness, while the null hypothesis would be simply the non-correlation with fitness, indicating non-selection. For methodological adaptationists, the non-selective hypothesis is often treated as the failure to find a explanation um, for which uh, they view as akin to scientific surrender. It's not seen as a positive explanation. In fact, the byproduct explanation is seen as no explanation at all. It cannot be an answer to our adaptive question. It is non-responsive to that question. Oops. Because the byproduct view of female orgasm says that orgasm has no function in females, it is seen as a failure of explanation. On leading animal behaviorist John Alcock and Paul Sherman's analysis, and remember, uh, Steve uh, Gould tangled with them when he first wrote up this case study. The byproduct hypothesis is a null result and offers only a, what they call approximate explanation of how women come to have orgasms. In other words, it explains how female babies grow up, grow up as to, at, to have orgasms as adult women, but does not offer an actual evolutionary account. And you can see this in Alcock's writing. If we were to discover the female orgasm occurred with positive effects on female reproductive success, we would gain an evolutionary dimension to our understanding of this trait that is not covered by any proximate explanation. So you see the byproduct account is not seen as an evolutionary account at all. It is not an answer to any evolutionary question about female orgasm with its own supporting evidence and theoretical standing. They treat it as a failure of an evolutionary explanation altogether. And this is clearly a result of the fact that the only answer to their adaptation question had to do with describing a function for female orgasm. With no reproductive function, the orgasm is seen as having no evolutionary role at all. I claim that this is a consequence of the logic of their research question. Similarly, David Barash, the author of the most widely selling textbook on sociobiology for a couple of decades and a grandfather of the field of human evolution, writes regarding the impetus of those favoring the byproduct theory that it involves a scientifically legitimate desire to explore all possible explanations for any biological enigma of this sort, including the null hypothesis that it might not be a direct product of evolution after all. And here, note the equivalence of evolution with adaptation or selection. The byproduct of it, uh, explanation is not considered evolutionary, just as we saw before with Alcock. So here we have the situation. We ask the methodological adaptationist question, what is the function of the female orgasm? And we consider the possible answers. The function of this trait is A or B, et cetera. But with too many failures, what we get is the null result, that the trait has no function in females. And they conclude that it may not be a direct product of evolution at all. So we consider, we, we, we should correct this to the answer. It may not be a direct product of selection at all. Um, or we consider the alternative, the real alternative. It is a byproduct of selection on the males and has no function in females. But notice in both cases that the, there is no function in females, which is still non-responsive to the question we started with. Now, take Instead, Simon's byproduct explanation, which should be seen in terms of the logic of the evolutionary factors research question. Specifically, what evolutionary factors account for the form and distribution of this trait, evolution, female orgasm? Possible answers include 
This trait does not have the function A, B, or Z. It does not seem to be an adaptation and likely has no function. This is equal to the adaptation is null hypothesis, or this trait has its current form and distribution largely because it is a byproduct of selection on the male orgasm. This is the correct reading of the byproduct theory, a positive alternative causal hypothesis. Hence, the methodological adaptationist portrayal of the byproduct hypothesis is misleading. In fact, it is incorrect. Significantly, when the byproduct hypothesis is treated as merely a non-answer to the adaptive evolutionary question asked, it, is, it also cannot be seen as accumulating evidence in its favor. As an answer to the more inclusive evolutionary factors question, the byproduct account is an alternate causal hypothesis to an adaptive account with a set of specific evolutionary mechanisms which can accumulate evidence in its favor. It is not merely a null result. Thus, even though the methodological adaptations present their adherence to their research program and its attendant question as perfectly harmless and in fact very good in productive science, we can see here exactly where it goes astray. A byproduct hypothesis cannot be an answer to a function question. While it is a perfectly good answer, an acceptable answer to an evolutionary factors question. We can see in these various researchers' responses to the orgasm case how confused they become by focusing only on their primary research question. For example, when a group of adaptationists were launching arguments against Steve Gould's presentation of Simon's byproduct hypothesis in Natural History magazine that was based on my analysis, they very strangely acted as if there was no empirical evidence considered at all. Adaptationist Donald Dewsbury, for example, claimed in response to Gould's discussion we need to study the consequences of orgasm for differential reproductive success and then determine whether a plausible case can be made for drawing the loop from present consequences to the past history of natural selection. These need to be studied, not asserted or denied a priori. The perception was clearly that no good evidence had entered into the debate. Despite Simon's entire chapter in 1979, detailing evidence supporting his theory, and Gould's appeals to 80 years of sexology evidence in his article, and so on. But since all of that evidence seemed to favor the byproduct view, a theory that was only considered a null account, it was invisible to these researchers. This is where the logic of research questions really does its damage. Gould and Lewinton complained in their Spandrel's paper that if one selectionist explanation failed to explain the trait under investigation, the adaptationists would simply turn to another adaptationist explanation, and, and then another, and another. There seemed no end of selection hypotheses that could be appealed to. In essence, there was no stopping rule for the research question, what is the function of this trait? As we saw under the function question, the byproduct account gets incorrectly classified as a null hypothesis. And a null hypothesis cannot have supporting independent evidence in its favor. On the logic of research questions, though, the evolutionary factors approach works very differently in terms of how to treat evidence. An adaptive hypothesis can be compared directly to a non-adaptive byproduct theory by comparing evidence in favor of each view. But the methodological adaptationists never get a chance to compare the byproduct hypothesis to a positive causal, uh, sorry, as a positive causal hypothesis because they have no stopping rule and have to give up on their quest for a functional hypothesis, at least temporarily, and switch questions. Under the logic of research questions, then, 
Those using the methodological adaptationist approach cannot adequately examine or evaluate the accumulated evidence for the byproduct approach. This evidence is in some sense only visible on the evolutionary factors approach, where the weight of evidence is the right rule to use in evaluating the byproduct hypothesis. The methodological adaptationists also make scientific errors arising from their bias. For example, several adaptationists repeatedly complain that under the byproduct hypothesis, female orgasm would just fade away and deteriorate over evolutionary time, just disappear from the species. This no no notion has been advocated not just by Alcock and Sherman and David Barish, but also by leading primatologist and evolutionist Sarah Blaffer Hurdy. And it's based on a misunderstanding of how the byproduct account works. Under that account, the basic ner muscle, nerve, and tissue pathways involved in orgasm would be maintained in the female over generations in virtue of the fact that they are under selection in the male. In conclusion, Gould's approach to evolutionary biology says that we shouldn't privilege adaption explanations automatically above other alternatives such as developmental or phyletic ones, and our research method should not bias our research outcomes. This is among the main messages of Gould and Lewinton's famous Spandrel's paper, which most biologists say is now passe, that biologists simply don't make these mistakes anymore if they ever did. This is clearly false, as we can see from this case today. Even in the most recent discussions in the orgasm controversy, the philosophical, theoretical, and evidential issues are unresolved. I am today using this case to highlight some risks of a particular approach to research into evolutionary causes. These risks become obvious when we examine the logic of research questions and their relevant answers within the methodological adaptationist approach. The presence of researchers like Simons who engaged in their research using the more inclusive evolutionary factors approach exemplify an available alternative method. Evolutionists all say that they've learned their lessons about an inclusive approach to evolutionary explanation from Gould and Lewinton's 1979 Spandrels article. But methodological adaptationism seems to make it very difficult for them to act on those lessons. Thank you very much. Grazie mille.